What's up, guys? Welcome to a new day. I'm Stephanie Ryder, and this is the 365 Shares Podcast. It's January 4th, 2024, and this is the fourth episode of the 365 Shares Podcast. As you may have noticed, I added a musical intro. This took me playing around with Spotify for podcasters for a few hours and watching a few YouTube videos, but I found that Spotify for podcasters offers a few dozen clips of royalty-free music that you can use for intros, for introducing new segments or co-hosts, and I went through all the clips and picked a few that I liked. So the intro that is now in the podcast The music is called Vitoro. I really like it. It's not too um, cheesy. It's not too funky. A lot of the clips are like really like funky and cool, but that's not really the vibe of this podcast. I just wanted to be something that picked up with a beat immediately and also gave you sort of a sense that we're working on things, but that we are positive and hopeful. So that was my intention for the intro of this podcast, and I'm really happy about it. The topic for today's reading is False Self, and it is from the Strengthening My Recovery Daily Affirmations book. It really talks about the false self that we all create when we are growing growing up in dysfunctional homes or unsafe homes, and the, the person we have to become or that we have to look like in order to survive these types of family situations. And then without recovery, we carry this version of ourselves or this false self, as ACA calls it, into adulthood, into the rest of our lives. And we often just grow to think that this is who we are. And ACA really tells us that we had an original self that was inherent to us when we were born and that this false self that we put on ourselves is not who we really are, who we need to be. It's just sort of an affectation or a coping mechanism. And I wanted to read for the first time the laundry list traits of adult children of alcoholics, also called the 14 traits, because this is really what tends to grab people, give people an aha moment. And this is also the group of traits that make up most people's false self. So here are the 14 traits of an adult child of an alcoholic. One. We became isolated and afraid of people and authority figures. Two, we became approval seekers and lost our identity in the process. Three, we are frightened by angry people and any personal criticism. Four, we either become alcoholics, marry them or both, or find another compulsive personality such as a workaholic to fill our sick abandonment needs. Five, We live life from the viewpoint of victims, and we are attracted to that weakness in our love and friendship relationships. Six, we have an overdeveloped sense of responsibility, and it is easier for us to be concerned with others rather than ourselves. This enables us not to look too closely at our own faults, etc. Seven, we get guilt feelings when we stand up for ourselves instead of giving in to others. Eight, we became addicted to excitement. Nine, we confuse love and pity and tend to love people we can pity and rescue. 10, we have stuffed our feelings from our traumatic childhoods and have lost the ability to feel or express our feelings because it hurts so much, in parentheses, denial. 11, we judge ourselves harshly and have a very low sense of self-esteem. 12, we are dependent personalities who are terrified of abandonment and will do anything to hold on to a relationship in order not to experience painful abandonment feelings, which we received from living with sick people who were never there emotionally for us. 13. Alcoholism is a family disease, and we became para-alcoholics and took on the characteristics of that disease even though we did not pick up the drink. 14. Para-alcoholics are reactors rather than actors. So that gives you an idea of some of the characteristics that make up what we call the false self. That is the title of today's affirmation. As always, I suggest that you read the whole affirmation in the Strengthening My Recovery book. This one is really, really good. But the affirmation I will share is, on this day, 
I will remember how far I have come. I treasure the self-knowledge I've gained in ACA that no longer gives my false self power. I'm Steph, and this is my share. So this is a great one. Um, I think my false self is something that I've really been trying to come to terms with over the past few years, really just getting a sense of who I am. And it's been really hard for me to figure out like what's my quote unquote real personality. I'm a Gemini, so I have a lot of personalities inherently anyway. And I grew up in a dysfunctional family. So I also developed a lot of maladaptive coping mechanisms that became part of my quote unquote personality. So I've really been trying to figure out who I am, who I who I am inherently. What's the version of me that I would have been if I'd had like a healthy, loving, attentive family? And I spent a lot of years before therapy and before recovery being very angry, being very codependent, being being very bossy. And I didn't like that version of myself. Other people in my life didn't like that version of myself. So I worked really hard on it. And I, I think I overcorrected and wanted to have this just really nice, very accommodating, almost like passive version of myself. And I thought that was what people wanted more. So in a way, I think I was almost creating a new false self in my early years of therapy and recovery to be more of the person that people liked or the, I will say the people who are like still surviving in my family liked, who I now don't feel like are terribly healthy, or who um, romantic partners would like. And some of the partners that I have picked either prior to recovery or in my early years of recovery also weren't terribly healthy. So I was like, I had this one version of myself that was very tough, that was no nonsense, that could really take care of myself and defend myself. And I got feedback that people didn't like that. So I changed. And then I became this like very passive person and also like a sad person because when for me personally, and I know for a lot of people, when we take the things that hurt us and we internalize them and we blame ourselves and we don't do anything about them and we don't stand up for ourselves, we tend to get really depressed and we tend to just really have more of a negative sense of ourselves because if people are hurting us and we're not standing up for ourselves, then like clearly we are the problem, which I no longer believe. And I had a really great therapy session where I talked to my therapist and said, you know, I know how to be angry and I know how to clap back at people. And as an aside, I apologize. I'm still a little bit sick. So if I, if my voice sounds weird or if I stop, it's because I'm like trying not to cough. But, um, but I had this session with my therapist where I said, you know, I know how to fight back and I know how to pretend that nothing's wrong or that something someone said isn't totally crazy or isn't hurtful or isn't um, just something that sounds like denial on their part. But I don't know how to, but then I would like be so angry still because I didn't vocalize what I was really feeling. So, and I, and I said, I don't know how to just have like some kind of a middle ground. And she suggested saying something along the lines of, hey, I'm going to stop you and I'm going to set a boundary and say, it hurts my feelings when you say that to me. Or that's not really what I believe. Or I personally don't think that that's the healthiest way to deal with things. And then kind of go from there. So I've been practicing setting healthy boundaries, but I tried to do that over the holidays and I did it, you know, from a, a triggered and an activated place where I was already angry with my sister and her, um, her initial reaction, which was so classic her was to make this really smug face that she always makes, not always makes, she's always made it in her life. Like she doesn't always make that face, but like throughout our lives, she's popped into this face that drives me crazy. This is like smug, like sort of like a head shake thing of like, she knows she's better than you. And I've, we've had so many fights about this. Um, so I said, I need to set a healthy boundary and say, you're not going to get involved in 
my relationships with other people or try to be the enforcer for things that other people want me to do. That just needs to be between me and those other people. And she was like so smug and so dismissive. And then a few days after the trip, and this is really, I think, what catalyzed me needing to take a break is I said something to her and she like she brought up my brother and then I said something about my brother and then she said, I'm going to need to set a hard boundary with you that you don't talk about him with me. And it was like so ridiculous and hypocritical because she had brought him up. Um, And then I just commented on what she said. And then she tried to use my therapy words that I learned in therapy against me. And she has not been in therapy since we were like little kids. She was six or seven. It was a child psychologist where you play with dolls. Um, And she has told me in the past that she doesn't need therapy because she already went to therapy when she was six. And I didn't say anything at the time because I was so gobsmacked about that statement. Not only, first of all, that anyone could think that playing with dolls in a child psychology office when you're six or seven has anything to do with adult therapy, any type of therapy, talk therapy, EMDR, somatic experiencing, internal family systems, um, just, you know, that there would be any relation to what we had, not only because when you're a child, you're not an adult, not only because the types of therapy modalities and the interventions that are available today are so much more advanced than what we had when in my childhood. And it would kind of be like saying, you know, I don't need cancer treatment. Like I had a cancer screening when I was six and I was fine. So um, it, it was sort of like that. And then it, I, I didn't know what to say. I never, I didn't say anything in the moment because I was so shocked. I never said anything to her for years afterwards. But it, it was just like either she's so and this is a mean thing to say, but like, she's so dumb that she doesn't know the difference or which is more likely she's so deeply in denial about the effect that our cumulative childhoods had on her. Like she thinks it's appropriate that my siblings, um, you know, my brother and I are in recovery and in therapy, but she also seems to think, or her false self seems to think that it's appropriate that she's not in therapy or any type of recovery program. So that's been a source of conflict. Um, and and yeah, I think um, I think the other side of it is that, like many people, she's got this sort of protective wall that doesn't want her to go into any old painful memories, and I completely understand that. And we grew up in the same family, but you know, we didn't have the same treatment. We didn't have the same experiences. She had some very big traumatic experiences that other people in the family didn't necessarily have. Um, So I think a lot of it is just her ego, her Freudian ego or her protective wall, trying to keep her from opening up an old can of worms that seems really scary or seems really insurmountable. And I understand that because it's hard to do that. And in my own therapy journey, I felt like I was peeling an onion and, um, but also like working backwards where I started in therapy going in and bitching about like, these are the things that are going on in my day-to-day life that are bothering me. This is what's going on at work that's driving me crazy. This is what my my family members said to me today. This is what my romantic partner just did. And then I started slowly working backwards into, okay, like now we're talking about past relationships. So I got really heavy into working on my marriage relationship, but after it had already dissolved and going backwards into that. And what did that mean? And why did I pick him? And what elements of my family dynamic and what things that happened to me in my childhood really, um, you know, led me to pick him. And then it was, you know, going back and back into, you know, other relationships, more deeper childhood stuff, like early childhood stuff. What's my first memory? What's my first trauma wound? So there were so many things that, um, there's so many things that I've tackled in therapy and it, it seems like, at least for me, I went for the low hanging fruit first and then had to work backwards and pick up more tools to get to like the really hard and really heavy things. And sorry, I'm going to cough. <coughs> I had to, um, 
you know, I had to go back and really say, it took a long time for me to get to like the hardest stuff. And I always have used the analogy of there's in one of the X-Men movies, Jean Grey is like exploding. She's just like exploding ball of energy and Wolverine has to get to her and he wants to get to her because she's destroying the whole world and he wants to stop that from happening. But he also loves her and wants to save her. And he has these regenerative regenerative abilities. So as he's like going toward her, his skin is ripping off and like his like muscles are melting and he's just constantly regenerating. And it's painful for him and he's regenerating himself as he's getting toward her until he can finally get to her and I think like stab her and kill her because he has to stop what's happening. So, and that I think is what like my therapy has really felt like is like stripping all this, you know, your false self, your life experiences, your feelings while you're constantly regenerating yourself and just like trying to get as deep into the root of the problem as possible. And it is really hard. And I understand people looking at that analogy and saying, wow, I really don't want to do that. I, I'm not Wolverine. I'm a normal person. I don't know if I would regenerate. I don't know if I would be able to come back from that. And that's totally fair. And so the most empathetic, kind part of me says, I understand why someone like my sister would pretend that they don't need this or that they've done it already because they just really don't want to do it and they don't know if they can survive it. And and I get that. So that is me being empathetic. Um, But then also to be fair to myself, I can say that that is like an insane thing to say. And it really felt hurtful to me and dismissive of all the work that I've done that I think is really important that it saved my life. So it can be both. You know, you can listen to what people say. You can be shocked. You can choose to be kind in the moment and honor their journey and their limitations. Maybe people aren't as strong as you are, and and that's where they are, and that's all they have to offer. But you can also say, either in the moment or after thinking about it, hey, that hurt my feelings. And if I could go back into that moment, I, I think that I would say, hey, If that's where you are in your journey and you don't have the bandwidth to do any more therapy, that's your, that's you. And that's fine with me. But I also just want to acknowledge for my own sanity and my own safety that playing with dolls when you're six is not the same as the type of therapy that I'm doing. And I would love it if you took an interest in hearing about the type of therapy that I'm doing and hearing what it's like and how it feels and what you do and the pros and the cons. So that's just something I think I've wanted to get off my chest for years since this conversation happened. And it was hard. It was hard as well when it happened because she was like driving me to the airport, which is so nice. And like, she's the only person in my family who's ever offered to drive me to the airport when I'm visiting family. And she really is the sweetest person in so many ways. And I think that's her true self. And then it's just, then there's also this false self that I deal with that's just so dismissive and so in denial and so protective of a very wounded core. So this was a long share. This is a longer episode. I mentioned that sometimes it was going to be juicy. I think this was pretty juicy. This is definitely me, um, you know, bringing some skeletons out of my closet. But again, this is just it's super therapeutic for me to talk about this stuff every day, even when I'm not going to a meeting. And outside of the share and the emotional aspect, this is a cool learning experience for me, learning how to put a podcast together, to edit audio, to add music, to start with uh, what they call a minimum viable product or MVP, which is just like me hitting play and doing a one take with no editing and no music and putting it out there for a few days and now evolving it into something that sounds a little bit more like what we expect in a commercially produced podcast. So thank you so much. I'm going to cough again. (coughs) And I know how to edit that out, but I'm not going to. But thank you so much for sticking with me. And, uh, And I really appreciate you guys. Thanks so much.